Okay, so on this lesson or on this activity, um, there's a relationship between the maximum heart rate and someone's age. Which one of those do you think is the independent variable and which one do you think is the dependent variable? Does the heart rate depend on the age or does the age depend on the heart rate? The heart rate depends on the age. So we're going to say this little box, we're going to say the age is the independent variable. And HR max is dependent. Sometimes it's easier to figure that out than others, but time and age, something like that, pretty much always has to be independent because nothing really controls that. Okay, now I just wrote some things. You do not have to have word for word what I have. You don't have to change what you wrote. It's okay. Um, and I didn't use like super mathy words. So, um, so the relationship, obviously, as a person gets older, the maximum heart rate goes down. And I heard a whole lot of people figuring out how much is going down, which is really good. That's what I wanted you to see. How much is it going down each year? One beat per minute. Good. So that's kind of how you can figure out B, which I got was 185 beats per minute. If you didn't see that it changed by one and you said it was something else for me, it's okay. As long as what you have is um, going to be in between 180 and 195 and closer to 180, then you're fine. Okay, and then we need the actual graph of the relationship. And so we want to do to use that graph to figure this out. So if we want to find the max heart rate of someone that's 60, you go to 60, and go over, and that's going to be 160 beats per minute. And then you also do it in reverse. So we find um, how old someone would be if their max heart rate is 200, and that's like 20 years old. Right, and then C kind of goes back to stuff you learned in Algebra 1, most likely. Um, you need to find the equation of this line. And so I did see a lot of people who wrote it one of these two ways. Um, I do, if you wrote it one of those two ways, I do want you to write it using function notation for me, please. So what we're going to do is just, this doesn't have a name. So let's just call it f of x equals and then... I'm going to use the first one. It doesn't matter. You can use either one of them. <coughs> now, because I'm using x and f of x, I'm going to go back and do some labeling because I want everything to be what it's supposed to be. So I'm going to label this independent, the independent variable or the horizontal axis x and the, just kidding, I'm not using y, the vertical axis f of x. And then I'm going to go back up to the table and do the same thing. So I'm just going to label the age x and the hr max f x. Okay. Now, I heard some people talking about this reasonable x value. So it just kind of depends on how old you think someone can live to. I chose 105. You may have chose 100 or 95 or whatever. Um, so I don't know the, how old the oldest person in the world is, but I'm just going to say 105. You can say what you want. However, if you did choose 105 for being like the max um, age, then could somebody possibly have a maximum heart rate of 100 feet per minute? And so depends on, they would have to live. 120. So if you think people can only live to 105, then you would say no. If you think people can live to 120, you could say yes. Probably not going to. Um, so that D part about the reasonable X values, what is that called like in mathy words? Something that describes the X values for a function. Is a variable, yes. It's not like where the function is defined or what x values you can use for that function. That's okay. That's the domain. And I'm going to actually describe the domain over there beside D in, um, as an inequality. So hopefully you wrote that the h cannot be negative. And I'm, I wrote that it also probably wouldn't be over 105. 
is it okay for the age to be zero? Yes. So we would say zero is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to 105. All right, what about E? What are we talking about on E? We're saying that um, we can't get this 100. What is that describing? Okay, it's gonna be the range. All right, so somebody who is 105, which I'm saying is the highest age we can get to, their heart max heart rate would be 115. So that should be the smallest maximum heart rate. I'm putting f of x in the middle. We don't use y a whole lot in pre-calculus or calculus. We always kind of refer to it as the name of the function. Um, and then what about the highest? 220. So little bitty babies have super high heart rates. Okay. And then this function doesn't really work as well for women as it does men. Um, typically, like, averages are, are found by like, middle-aged men. So, like, the average temperature is 98.7. Well, that's the average temperature for middle-aged men. So, it's not a great one to use, but I guess that's who they surveyed a long time ago to figure it out. So, um, this is the formula that they would use or the function they would use for women. And so, you just evaluate that function and describe what it means. So, I, you don't have to have exactly what I have, but I wrote that. A 32-year-old woman has an estimated maximum heart rate of 177.84 Okay? So domain and range and evaluating functions are all things you've done before. So this is maybe looking at it a little bit differently. All right, so I'm going to give you your actual notes. And one thing I am going to try to do, um, the lessons aren't labeled exactly like what goes in the book. So um, I'm going to try to remember to always just kind of put what section of the book is in. Uh, right now, it doesn't matter because you don't have a book yet, but you will have one pretty soon. Okay, so um, this is all about functions and function notation. So a function is going to describe a relationship. Between an independent variable. and a dependent variable. Now, in the world of mathematics, there are a ton of relationships that aren't functional relationships, and that's okay. Like a circle, a circle, there is a relationship, definitely, between the input and output. It's just not a functional relationship, and that's fine. Um, you're gonna need to put your phone away, please. All right. So um, each input, well, you guys tell me. So what makes a function special compared to a relation? About each input, what is it matched with? Do you remember? Exactly one output. So if you're evaluating a function and you give two answers for one number, that has to be wrong, or it's not a function that can't happen. Okay, so I just made up a function this morning, and we're going to represent this function three different ways. So we're going to represent with a table, a mapping, and a graph. And we could give an equation for it as well if you wanted to. All right, so on our table, the x's are going to be negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And then the y's are going to be 3. Two, 
All right, on the mapping, instead of using the X's and Y's, you typically use the words input and output. And I'm just going to list for the input. In this case, they're, they're going to be the X's. And the output's going to be the Y's, and typically these are listed in numerical order. Sorry. Right, and then you just pair them up. So negative one is paired with three. Zero two. One is also paired with three. And two is paired with three. So on a table, if you're trying to decide if it's a function, it's fairly obvious. You look at the x as long as there's not a negative one twice, like a negative one paired with three and a negative one paired with two, then you're fine. I'm on a mapping, just make sure there's only one arrow coming out of each input. What do you do for a graph? Like if you have the graph, how do you decide if it's a function? Do you guys remember? If it passes the vertical line test. Is that not what you said? Oh, <laughs> what I heard. All right, so on the x-axis, I'm just going to label by one. But to make it fit on the wax, I'm going to go by twos. You can do it however you want to. As long as the function passes the vertical line test, that's the function. This one, I just went ahead and graphed it, just to order pairs. We could connect them if we want to, we don't really know. All right, now you guys did it. evaluating a couple of functions, actually. One you used a graph to evaluate it, and another one you just actually used the algebraic expression. But anytime you're evaluating a function, you're finding the outfit. I left out a word, so we're just going to say for the given input. All right, and I think you guys should be fairly familiar with function notation. So, uh, function notation is I'm going to do f of a equals b where A is the input and B is the output. Okay, and we kind of already talked about these things, so it seems repetitive, but just to make sure everyone's clear, um, the set of inputs of a function is called the domain. And it consists that if inputs consist of the values where the function is defined. So this is not technically going to come up today in the notes, but what makes some what makes a function undefined? So there's two things mathematically that you cannot do. Like it would give you an error in the calculator if you try to do it. These two. Square root of a negative. Now, you learned in number two last year that gives you an imaginary number, but with functions, it's all real. We're not talking about anything imaginary with functions. So, have in the square root of a negative. Divide by zero. Divide by zero. Divide by zero. Those are the two things. I'm glad you guys, you remember that. That's awesome. All right. So, and then the set of outputs is called the range. Okay, so um, on number one, we have the volume of a sphere given by radius as r is given by that v of r function. 
Hopefully you remember that from geometry. If not, you might see it again on the ACT. I'm not going to expect you to remember it. If I want you to find the volume, I don't think I will, but I would give it to you. Um, but you might want to store it away. Um, so on this problem, on this function, which is independent and which is dependent? Which is independent? The radius or the volume? The radius. Now, one thing I want you guys to get in the habit of doing is using the variables in the problem. Um, so, like, if you ever have to, like, when we go down and describe the domain, don't use X for the domain here. We're going to use R for the domain. Um, so, that's, I don't think that's something you have really focused on before, but we're going to try to always use the right variables. Okay, to save on time, I'm just going to, I already plugged these in. I'm fairly confident you can plug numbers into your calculator. So whenever I plugged in 1 as the radius, I got a volume of 4.189. 3, I got 113.1. 5, I got 523.6. And 7, 1436.8. All right, and then C asks to describe how increasing the, vo the radius affects the volume. What happens to the volume as the radius increases? It also increases. Does it increase at the same rate? Kind of like on the one on the front, it doesn't. It increases way faster. So we're going to try to word that where it makes sense. So increasing the radius. the volume at a faster rate. All right, and then let's talk about reasonable domain. Um, so, can you have a negative radius? No. Can you have a radius of zero without form of a sphere? No. So, um, I'm just going to say that our radius needs to be greater than zero. I'm not going to cap off a radius because think about the radius of the Earth. That's huge, like 4,000 something, I think. Or the radius of Jupiter, or the radius of the planet, we don't even know. So I'm just going to say the radius can be greater than zero. So what is that going to make the range? It's going to be the same, um, greater than zero. Okay, so we have a couple more problems. They both have multiple parts, but they're not going to be too bad. Um, so for number two, the length of a skid mark left by a car when braking in feet um, can be used to predict the speed in miles per hour at which the car is driving when it hits the brakes. Now, I don't have like a resource or a source for this. I, I'm assuming it's true, um, but I don't know for sure. But the speed of the car is given by the square root of 21 times the length of the skid mark. Some of you are in um, criminal justice. You might be able to know if this is true. I don't know. But I think the police probably used something like this to figure this out. Um, so we're going to use a rule or use function notation to write the rule, and we are going to define our variables. So I'm going to let L be the length of the skid mark. And since it is um, a speed, I'm going to do S of L 
be the estimated speed of the car. Now we're going to use function notation, so I'm going to call it S sub L equals. What do y'all think? How can we go from words to symbols? Use Now we're going to figure this out. Uh, we're going to figure out how fast a car was traveling if that car left a skid mark that was 100 feet long. What are we going to do with that 100? We're going to put it in for L. I said that we we're going to put it in for L. All right, so the square root of 2100 is approximately 45. 0.826 miles per hour. You may have noticed, well, maybe not. Actually, this is the first time I've done it. Um, I'm, wh when we round in here, we're always going to round two, three decimal places. Um, that's what the AP readers want to. So on the AP exam, part of it's multiple choice and part of it's free response. On the free response, they want three decimal places. So you can do this one of two ways. You can round the third decimal place, or you can do something called truncate, where you just drop off what's after the third decimal place. Both of them are perfect. I'll tell you this a million times, so don't worry. Um, but, uh, and you can go to four, but you just have to be accurate to three places. Okay, so let's look at the last one. I love these questions, and you guys don't really get to practice them very much um, in algebra one out here. I just don't. Well, I don't feel like you do. I haven't taught algebra one in a very, very long time. So maybe you do. But we're going to evaluate a function based on the graph. And so um, this graph is f of x. And so we're just going to find all of these values. <clears throat> so if we want to find f of negative 9, we're just going to go to where x is negative 9. And we're going to go up to the graph. What is the value of the function up there? Four. So that's just four. Now sometimes it's a little trickier than that, like the next one. F of negative six. Negative six is here. There's two kind of points at negative six. But is it possible for you to have two values here and it be a function? No, you can only get one. If it's a function, F of negative six only has one answer. Which one do you think it is? Zero or four? It's going to be four. It's going to be the closed circle. Okay, f of negative three. Nothing weird's going on there. You just go to negative three, find the value of the function. It is also negative three. So you guys try to do D through G on your own, and then let me know if there's something you're still confused about. What do you guys think happens if you don't have a closed circle? So like, for example, if these were both open, do you know what you would say for f of negative one in that case? Undefined. Undefined, good. So sometimes the function isn't defined at a value, and that's fine. You'll just say undefined if that happens. It's possible that's going to happen on your homework. We'll talk more about it. 
Okay, so I'm just going to give you your <clears throat> worksheet. 